G'day, it's Jamie, and welcome to Where's My Yowie. Today, I'm reading an old Aussie bush yarn from 1878, so we'll get into it. This was published in the Australasian on Saturday, the 5th of October, 1878, titled The Cranky Shepherd by James Lockhart. It is a singular and curious fact that insanity in various forms is extremely prevalent among the Bushmen of Australia. The afflicted ones are seldom seen, however, among the busy wheat paddocks of Victoria. The Murray must be crossed and the upper waters of the Darling sighted before their everyday haunts are transversed. Then it is not an uncommon thing to meet a bald-headed elderly man with the remnant of an old sack about his shoulders and a long rough stick in his hand, shuffling along with his eyes bent upon the ground, muttering to himself. When spoken to, he either stands and states and cackles uproariously or starts off the track without a word and runs howling into the bush. It is hard to say how they really live from day to day. As a rule, they dislike society. Although, every now and then, one makes his appearance at the stations, when hard-pressed for the staff of life. From time to time, one suddenly disappears from the localities where he is known by sight. No doubt, many of them perish miserably. This accounts for the human skeletons, which are so often found on the arid saltbush plains by the boundary riders at mustering time and interred in a shallow grave where they lie. Sometimes the occurrence finds itself into the nearest newspaper and sometimes not. The causes which lead to this dethronement of the reason are inseparable from the bushman's life. He eats his bread in solitude for long periods of time. He has no wife to listen for his footstep when the sheep are folded for the night, or the maul and the wedges laid aside for the day, and no mental activity to brace his facilities and keep his mind in tone and balance. He sits and broods over the dying embers and dreams of impossible things. The fire shadows take strange shapes and beckon to him with outstretched, unshapely arms. Voices which seem to come from afar whisper to him in the starry stillness and goad him to unnatural acts until he feels that he must have communication with his fellow men or die. A few days' ride, in most cases, brings him face to face with a greater danger, the shanty keeper, with his murderous compounds, completes the ruin already begun. After being poisoned and plundered, he is thrust out the doors to die in the wilderness or look for the road to Bedlam. Partial derangement, however, is more common than absolute madness. Almost every old shepherd westward of the Paru has some mania peculiar to himself. The force of circumstances, rather than my own inclination, once took me into that remote locality and brought me into close contact with one of those unfortunate men. The station where I was employed was dovetailed betwixt two stupendous crags of a romantic niche on the east side of a low but dark-browed mountain range, which runs almost without a break for over a 100 miles from north to south. It is a waterless and dreary region, although subject to sudden gusts of storm, which fill the scoured and empty torrent beds to overflowing with the downpour of an hour. Shreds of trading clouds slumber among the serrated peaks nearly all year round, and the mountain sides are pencilled over with streaks of gloom. The dingo makes his lair 
among the shadows of the deep ravines. As a grazing ground, it is perhaps unequaled in the world. The salt bush and cotton bush and other fragrant and fattening herbs which cover the far-spreading valleys that open up out upon the endless plains have always a refreshing tint of green. The sheep run was of vast extent, indeed. There was no boundary line at all to the northward, and it was entirely open and unenclosed. The flocks were therefore all in the charge of shepherds, who lived many miles apart from one another. It was my duty to supply those men with the necessities of life, and visit each of them in rotation at least once a fortnight. A half-demented individual, whom the manager had picked up on the run, with no clothing on his body except a tattered blanket around his loins, was in charge of a breeding flock on one of the outpost stations. Although quite harmless and perfectly trustworthy in his occupation, his appearance was wild and startling. He always went about bareheaded and barefooted, and his long iron grey locks hung around a haggard face, burned as brown as a berry. He had been several years in the same employment, yet his previous life was as much a mystery as if he had dropped from the clouds. The underground hut where he lived had the reputation of being haunted by the spirit of a murdered woman who had led an evil life all her days. It certainly had been the scene of a most bloody and unnatural crime, too horrible to be set down in black and white. Some of those lodges in the wilderness have histories quite as terrible as the legends of old world ruins. The sun was going down behind the mountains in a haze of crimson fire as I drove up to the door of the cranky shepherd with the fortnight's rations on a sultry midsummer's eve. The sheep were in the yard the sheep dogs were on a chain, and the three sentinel crows sat croaking, with their heads laid together, as usual, upon the topmost bough of a skeleton tree. The harsh, deep tones of the man came up the flight of steps, and sounded in the deep stillness like the voice of a ventriloquist practising his art. It was the cranky shepherd talking to himself. Why don't you always keep the same shape, he cried. You've no pity for me. Sometimes you're a man and sometimes you're a beast. You must be the devil. Where's that knife in your hand you had a minute ago? He paused a moment like a man waiting for an answer. Then he began again. You never had a knife. I know better. You've got it up your sleeve now. I know your tricks. You're waiting until I fall asleep. And then you'll begin your wicked work. But I'll balk you for once. I'll sleep no more. In the excitement of his raving, I remained for some moments unobserved, looking in at him through the open doorway. A great change had come over him since my previous visit. He looked like a man, new risen from the dead. He was worn to the bone, and he had painted his naked body with tiger stripes of white, after the manner of Aborigines. You've come just in time, he muttered, when he looked around and glared upon me with bloodshot eyes. Help me lay this hairy demon. You are not well, Walker, I said. There is nothing there. It's only your sick fancies. You're dreaming. Are you on his side too, he moaned. He's tempting me all day to put a knife to my throat, and he tells me I'll never see salvation. Is it all a lie? I'm not entirely forgotten. It's a long way to the stars, but God remembers to water his brackish mite of clay. Look, oh look, he's a black swan now. He takes many shapes. I tried to cheer him up and laugh away his terrors. After a little while, I partially succeeded, but he persistently refused to take food. He breathes upon every morsel. I put it to my mouth with his foul breath, he said. How can I eat? I've been living for the last fortnight on green stuff like the beasts of the field. I don't think I'll live long. It struck me that he spoke the truth. 
To tell the truth, I would rather not have stayed with him overnight by myself. As it was, I made up my mind to sit up until daybreak and keep the lamp burning. The talking fit had left him. He sat crouching in the furthest corner in perfect silence. When I spoke to him, he made no reply. I sat and watched him until I was tired, then chose to sleep away. I went outside to look about me. The full moon, as large as a wintry sun, was shining straight overhead, and the rugged background of broken ranges was furrowed with light and shade. The pent-up sheep scarcely seemed to breathe, and not a sound broke the silence of the shining plains. I was on point of starting to look for the hobbled horses when a great inarticulate cry from the man inside made me jump clean off my feet and run back to the hut. I found him standing with his head sunk between his shoulders and his bent left arm raised like a man in the act of warding off a fatal blow. His mouth was working and he seemed to struggle for utterance but no sound escaped his lips. His eyes glared horribly. I was really afraid of him. As an act of precaution, I took the sheath knife, which lay exposed upon the table, and pitched it out the door. His dumb struggling was the most fearful sight I ever saw, but it soon came to an end. He fell upon his knees as suddenly as if he had been poleaxed by an invisible hand dropped his whole length upon the floor and never moved again. When I lifted him up, I knew that I was alone with a dead man for the first time in my life. He was buried the next day in a bar coffin at the foot of the open hills. He left nothing behind him which threw any light on his past history. A new shepherd took the flock which he had followed so long his dogs found a new master, and the poor castaway was almost at once forgotten the end. Well, that's a crazy story, that. It should have been called The Crazy Shepherd, not The Cranky Shepherd. And if I was the guy coming to bring him the stores or anything like that, he was acting crazy and talking like that, I would have just gone, OK, mate, there's your stuff. I'll see you in a fortnight's time. Bye. OK, that's it for me. I'll get back to you all next time. Bye.